Welcome back, everyone. We're here with another Q&A on the topic of health. Anything that I say is definitely not meant to replace your medical care. Check with your doc before um, taking any of the advice. But we have some real interesting uh, things to talk about and some great questions that we want to answer. Let's just dive right in, Steve, and do as many as we can. Excellent idea. Let's start off with social media today. We love them. Yaz Media from YouTube. How do combine my fat intake with, oh good, here's another one of these words, lithosis in my gallbladder. I am not convinced I have to have it removed. So did I say that right? Combine fat intake with lithosis is how it's spelled. Is well, what, here, here, here's the thing. I, I don't, I'm like missing a little bit of information. I don't know um, if you have large stones or no stones or small stones, but the, the point is that um, realize that gallstones don't just come from cholesterol. It's a combination of cholesterol and a lack of bile. So if you don't have enough bile, then you get this super concentrated um, like uh, uh, cholesterol stone that can develop. So the solution is to increase the amount of bile salt, okay? And that's going to help you. Um, you know, of course, if you if you do the diet that I recommend, you're doing a combination of great, uh, you know, plants and vegetables and things like that with your protein, with your fat. And, um, and also, um, I have so many videos in gallbladder, you should watch those. But uh, I would start taking a, a bile salt formula, um, maybe gallbladder formula, and just start taking that on a regular basis to, to start to reverse this ratio so you can um, resolve it. Uh, and then maybe don't consume a massive amount of fat right now until you get things situated. Um, I had a lot of gallbladder problems early on. And of course, my problem was not just saturated fat. It was the combination of saturated fat and all the carbs I was doing at the same time. <clears throat> that probably created the problem. Okay, very good. Let's see. Now, I don't know if Sandra's pushing the envelope here on YouTube, but she wants to know if she can have her sourdough bread as a part of the keto diet, and can I use coconut or almond flour? Maybe that's, uh, what do you think, Doc? Is she going to make the bread out of coconut flour? Well, that's what I'm Maybe I, there's a way you guessing. can do that. I don't know. Um, that would be interesting. Um, if you can make a sourdough bread out of uh, of that flour, that that would be that would be good. I don't know what it would taste like, but um, it might be um, edible. Would that meet the requirements of being keto, perhaps? Yeah, if there's no other um, grains in there, if there's not added grains, because sometimes the you see these recipes of these keto friendly um, breads, but then it has the tapioca in there. It has uh, you know gluten, wheat because it's protein, but it's undigestible by humans. So you really have to just have knowledge of what you should have and what you should avoid. Okay, very good. Sandra, we would love to hear back from you to see what that tastes like. Maybe send us a snapshot and we'll publish you. Okay, let's see. Why don't we kick off with our first quiz question today, Dr. Bergen. By the way, audience, all of them are questions, no true falsers. So you can't get away with the 50-50 coin flip today. You're going to have to really put your thinking caps on. And here it is. Okay. Which vitamin deficiency is behind bladder issues? Like I'm talking about a leaky bladder, frequent urination, you know, incomplete empty of your urinary bladder or urgency. What is what vitamin deficiency is really behind the majority of those problems? All right, very good. Dig into that audience. Uh, and here's another set of love lover, letter uh, for you, Dr. Berg. Tammy from YouTube, thank you for all your educational videos. You have made me more aware of my health. You are amazing. Thank you, Dr. Berg. And I echo that. My intermittent fasting has got me out of the pudgy zone for some time, and I'm very grateful for that as well, Dr. Berg. No, okay, that. you bet. Bob from YouTube, does sleeping up to 12 hours a day a part of a healthy fasting? That's interesting. Well, um, I think it wouldn't hurt if you get more sleep. That's for sure. I mean, the more, um, I mean, I don't know, I don't know if I could do that. I mean, sleep for twelve hours that would be very difficult to do. But if you could do it occasionally, it'd probably probably help you. Probably catch up on all the lack of sleep that you might be getting. Very good. Uh, let's stay on YouTube for a second. This is Osama from YouTube. The skin on my face turned yellow since I followed healthy keto. 
Uh, I take vitamin D supplements, trace elements, and B vitamins. I have a blood test, and the results were normal. What do you think uh, the cause might be? Now, with Osama, I don't know, you know if he's from an Asian country or whatever. Or he has white skin, so it's a little uh, difficult, right, to determine where he started. But he's got yellow skin now. <clears throat> well, uh, of course, if you don't have jaundice and your liver's healthy, then it could be something you're eating with um, some pigmentation are you eating a lot of carrots hopefully you're not doing a lot of carrot juice um are you doing a lot of uh turmeric i mean all these things potentially could could make you a bit on the yellow side um but um i i don't know i really don't know i'd have to get more of a history these i can only guess um all right, very good. Well, listen, Dr. Berg, I know you have a certain fondness for Canada, so I thought it would be appropriate to start off with our guest from Ontario, and his name is Chris. And Chris, if you're unmuted, you are on with Dr. Berg. Oh, there we go. Oh, can you hear me? We sure can. Perfectly. Oh, great. Good morning, Dr. Berg. Good morning. Uh, just want to start out by saying uh, I, I'm not a long time watcher. I've just discovered you since Christmas time, uh, but certainly uh, made a huge difference when I discovered bile salts. Uh, about three years ago, I had my gallbladder removed after a long, lengthy process of figuring all of this out. And uh, nobody said anything about bile salts. Mm. And I couldn't figure out why I was feeling so terrible. Mm. So uh, thank you very much for that, as well as a lot of the other. Uh, bits and pieces that I picked up along the way. The turmeric one was a great one, and our local grocery store actually carries it. So the, the actual turmeric as opposed to the, the tablet. So I was very pleased to find that. Uh, my question today, I guess, is maybe twofold. You kind of answered it with your, uh, your video that dropped today. I'm still having a lot of issues in my stomach area, and, and they actually cleared up for quite a, quite a while. It's only been the last couple of weeks, and I started to feel... Um, the fullness under my right ribs again and kind of radiating up to the shoulder. And it sounds like from the video that came out today, it might be more a pancreatic problem. Mm. Um, and all the things that you talked about today are in your bile salts, all the extra things to take. So the, I guess the first part of the question is, should I take more of those um, as opposed to just taking them when I'm eating? Uh, and then the second part is uh, somehow maybe taking the extra vitamins that I've started taking since watching you and over the last month and a half or so somehow causing a problem. Should I, should I take them spread out more during the day? Should I take them concentrated? I'm not quite sure on that. Yeah. I, it, I think that for the first question, I think um, you're on the right track. Yes. You could take um, additional uh, gallbladder form, uh, formula on empty stomach because that way you can work on the bile ducts. I mean, think about it. You'd, I'm, I, I think you mentioned that you removed the gallbladder. Um, so what that means now is you just don't have the concentrated amount of bile. You have bile coming trickling down there, but it's just not in the right amounts or concentration. So you're always going to have like a little weakness there, which means that you could still have a bit of sludge within the, 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 the tubing, the, the pipes from your liver to not just the gallbladder, um, where the gallbladder used to be like to the small intestine, but also wraps around to uh, a point where the pancreas connects. And that could be a little backed up and create a little pancreatic problem and uh, maybe even a deficiency of those pancreatic enzymes. So I think that's probably sounds like the weakness that um, you just have to keep working on. And uh, that takes some time. Um, you might benefit from definitely betaine hydrochloride because that'll actually really help at the stomach level and maybe some enzymes too. But I wouldn't jump to too many things at once. I would try one thing at a time. One thing that might be also beneficial if you have a fatty liver would be to add some choline to your diet because that, that can act like uh, an additional support to keep that liver really, you know, cleaned out. And so stuff can actually start coming out. And then also, don't forget the the basic eating plan. Make sure that um, you know you're applying some of the the basic healthy keto um, that I recommend. Just that way, you'll have uh, a nice combination of foods that won't create problems in the future. Um, because we we want to look at the original reason why you had a gallbladder problem in the first place, right? And you want we want to correct that. 
Um, but if you have that right sensation underneath your right gallbladder, um, I would um, I would suspect there's just more sludge that needs to be dealt with. And uh, yeah, so just add that on an empty stomach, and that should thin more of the bile, and that should you know, you can keep increasing until that sensation goes away. And then you know, okay, I need that much for a while. And then as your diet improves, that symptom should go away. I used to have that all the time. In fact, I think I had it for 12 years. I had no idea about where it was coming from. And uh, thank goodness I, I figured it out because it's it's really a, a pain underneath your right rib cage. Indeed. Well, hey, listen, thanks for being our inaugural visitor on the show, Chris. You did a great job, and we'd love to hear back from you about all your successes with your ailing gallbladder. Okay, uh, we kicked off today with our first Thank question. You. you. You betcha. Anytime, Chris. Get back with us. All right, let's see. Uh, our first quiz question uh, asked, if I push the right button, uh, which vitamin deficiency is behind bladder issues, leaky, frequent urination, incomplete, emptying of the bladder, and other earthy things? And our audience, 70% of them said vitamin C, 15% say vitamin D, and 15% say vitamin B as in boy. Drum roll, please, Dr. Berg. How'd they do? The answer is uh, thymine, B1 deficiency. And let me just explain, because... There are a lot of people who have problems with their bladder and they get up to the night, they have issues with um, urgency and then they, they have to go, but not a lot comes out. Um, there's just a lot of issues with the bladder. Uh, I did a deep dive into this subject recently and found some fascinating information with, um, that correlates with what I already knew. And unfortunately, when you try to research this topic, you're not going to find it because the first probably 10 pages on Google is all the same old, same old, you know, it's just trash. It's like, they don't give you, it's like a bunch of companies that hired um, SEO people to just come up with content based on keywords, but there's no real answers. And so you end up going to the doctor and getting another med and whatever, and then having it cause side effects. But B1, um, if you look up the relationship between B1 and all these problems with the bladder, you'll have all this interesting stuff come up um, that relate to um, the muscle, the nerve connection to the muscle that surrounds the bladder itself. And so um, that connection is is very interesting because when you don't have enough B1, and that usually comes from consuming years of carbs and sugars and alcohol and things like that, you can um, affect that nerve many different areas, even in the brain, the actual center in the brain that controls the bladder, the holding of the urine and the releasing of the bladder is highly sensitive to a B1 deficiency. So what is the solution? You start taking a natural B1 and you also, I would take in addition to that uh, benfotamine, which is that fat soluble B1 that can also help more on the brain level if there is a problem in there and uh, restore that. And there's some great data that shows that, you know, even by taking, you might have to take it up to three months, but I think you'll probably see changes within, you know, a week or two. And of course, change the diet as well. Um, but that's, uh, if you have that problem, it's really important to know that connection. All right, very good. Well, later in the show, we're going to hear from Marga, who is a transplant from Russia. So as we talk about who's watching, I'm going to go ahead and credit her with uh, chiming in on behalf of uh Russia. And in addition to that, we'd like to say hello to those in UK, Canada, Mexico, Switzerland, Jordan, Sweden, Ethiopia, Poland, Norway, Chile, Oman, Algeria, the Netherlands, Japan, United Arab Emirates, France, Italy, Taiwan, India, Nepal, Argentina, Serbia, uh, Iran, Belgium, Colombia, Ireland, Greece, Pakistan, Bermuda, Cuba, Scotland, uh, Eritrea, uh, Kuwait, Yemen, Israel, uh, the Dominican Republic, Turkey, New Zealand, Australia, Sri Lanka, Trinidad and Tobago, the Virgin Islands, Malta, I don't think we've heard from them for a while, Peru, Finland, Jamaica, Lithuania, Syria, Nigeria, South Africa, Germany, Aruba, a great place, Portugal, the Philippines, Egypt, Qatar, uh, che uh, Chechnya, or Chechia, or Chechia, I, I don't think it's Chechnya. Anyway, sorry, Terry, I blew that reading. Austria, Croatia, 
Brazil, Slovenia, Romania, and all across these United States. And as usual, there'll be some frustrated people that didn't hear their name, and they're going to chime in and add to that list. So we'll wait for that. So thanks, everybody, for listening. And, of course, all across these wonderful United States, if I didn't say that. Let's go back to social media. Lucy from YouTube, my amylase level is at 164. The normal is 110. Does this mean I have pancreatitis? Yeah, right. I, I can't diagnose that with just that one value. You know, here's the thing. When you when you evaluate someone, you really have to um, use as much information as possible, get a history. Uh, it, potentially, it could be one of the causes, but um, you really have to um, take all the factors and make sure there's no missing information. Like probably recently, Steve, I don't know if you've heard uh, in the news, it's all over the news, um, that erythritol has now been found uh, linked to um, heart attacks and strokes. Have you heard about that? No, but it doesn't surprise me. It'll be back to salt so next week. Any, or something. If anyone is interested in me talking about that, uh, let me know and we will talk about that. But, um, uh, you know, in the keto community, you know, people are saying, oh my gosh, it's, wow, I've been eating that for a while. I hope I don't drop dead of a heart attack. Well, it, this is a perfect example of, um, of just missing information when you evaluate and probably on purpose to, to make something sound really bad. But in reality, when you have all, all the information, it's like, it's ridiculous. But um, yeah, I, I really don't know about your pancreatitis, but um, if you have it or not, but um, there's uh, many causes. And uh, I think probably the most common cause with a problem with your enzymes especially the pancreas, would be some problem in the, the ducts that are causing pressure or inflammation or a backup. And what I would do if I were you as a really inexpensive way to um, potentially solve it is I would start taking tudka, which is that it's a type of bile salt that will definitely open up those ducts. And if you feel better within a couple of days, then, that's, then we know. It's a problem with the sludge. This is a, this bile sludge is probably, I mean, it's just a super common problem that m most people have never even heard of. So um, it can create a lot of nausea and uh, bloating and um, especially um, problems related to the gallbladder and the pancreas. So um, I have vid videos on it. And so it's, uh, it's valuable to know that if, if you have any of those symptoms. All right, very good. Well, uh, uh, be forewarned, uh, audience, uh, no erythritol back to two or three cups of sugar per day with the food pyramid, uh, with all the carbs and so on. So you'll feel a lot better once you get that back underway. Okay, now here we go with our second question. Once again, no true-false today. There it is, Doc. Okay, the best way to deal with um, the vitamin D side effects, like some people get fatigue, insomnia, headache, constipation, even diarrhea when they take vitamin D. Okay, so what's the best way to deal with that? Is it not to take the vitamin D or what else could you do to solve that problem? Okay, here we have a very popular question we hear a lot. V from Facebook, I'm new to keto. How do I eliminate my craving for sweets? I mean, it's the easiest thing in the world. You just basically reduce your dietary consumption of sweets to get rid of your craving for sweets. You can't get rid of it by keeping, continuing to eat sweets. So you reduce your sweets and then your body has no choice but to start burning your own fat. And that transition takes three days. And if you want to speed it up even more, then you practice intermittent fasting. You don't eat as frequent, um, maybe two meals a day. Now, is it going to be hard to do initially? Well, not if you add more fat to the diet to be more satisfied. But within three days, all of a sudden you've adapted, your cravings are gone, and now you're not hungry anymore. It's really fascinating. You have to try it to believe it, and uh, once you do it, you'll be, well, wow, that was amazing. I didn't know that would work like that, but it does, and uh, now you're burning fat. It's a different fuel source, and uh, you're going to feel much, much better. V, we are all rooting for you. Go, um, girl, I assume, and uh, get back with us and let us know about how you don't give a darn about sweets anymore. Okay, let's see. Denise from Facebook. I take pure therapeutic fermented ketones. 
Never heard of that. And now off all meds. That's great. Lost body fat and better whole health all around. Down 106 pounds. Wow, that's the bell for three bell rings for that. Why aren't more people not using this magic? So she got over the sweet uh, cravings, it sounds like. Wow. There's two ways to um, get ketones. Well, there's more more ways than two, but um, you can um, cut down your carbs to get your, um, your body to make more ketones. Um, and then you can actually uh, also not eat and then your body will actually turn your own fat into ketones so it has the ability to um to change your dietary fat into ketones as well as um your own body fat into ketones and and basically you just need to do two things is cut down carbs and don't eat so so often and cut out those snacks steve is anyone uh, is you see on social media is anyone interested in knowing more about this uh, erythritol uh, heart con- problem connection or are they not really commenting about it. Well, that's a question for Terry because he wonderfully sort of, uh, you know, gauges which messages to send me. So, Terry, the word out to you. Any uh, action on erythritol? And also, uh, Alec, he's watching on there for various things on social media. So, Alec, if you see anything that has to do with the erythritol questions, please let your uh, local producer know, and we'll get that back to Dr. Berg. So, Pressure's on Alec and Terry for that. But that's an interesting question. I mean, I, you know, I use it. But, you know, I'm 69, Doc, and everything was going to kill me every five years for the last 69 years. Salt, no salt, you know, this, that. So I guess I've won, but erythritol hasn't put me down yet. So um, I'm going to call that victory. Now, as promised, there are some people that feel... Uh, very dejected because we didn't mention their name, but they didn't mention their name on it. And here they are. Here are the people that we're going to mention. Ghana, India, South Korea, Albania, uh, Jamaica, Somalia, Saudi Arabia, and Spain. Welcome on board, everyone. I can't imagine there's many uh, countries around the world that are left off the list today. So let's see. Uh, Oh, um, here we go. Uh, Terry's just chimed in. Our audience overwhelmingly wants Dr. Bark to discuss in depth the results of the erythritol study with four exclamation marks. So yes, that is a topic of interest, Doc. Let me just touch on it real fast. I, I'm gonna, you'll see a whole video on it, but we don't need to spend a lot of time on it. But here, here's the thing. This study is all over the news. It's in social media. Um, so if you actually read the study, um, it's not even a study about the dietary erythritol. Okay, it's not even it is not it's not about a person consuming erythritol at all. That's interesting. It's about your body making its own erythritol. So the people that had the most erythritol from endogenous, which means your body makes it, um, uh, was had a had a soci- or a correlation to a heart problem, right? Okay, so what? There's some some missing data. There's a missing piece of the puzzle here that people don't know. Um, your body makes erythritol as a byproduct of uh, glucose metabolism. So the people that have the most erythritol in their blood are the people who are consuming the most sugar, like diabetics, people eating fructose, a lot of fruit. Um, as well as it, it's, it increases when you have oxidative stress, as in kidney disease, liver disease, okay? So, and even belly fat. So you're going to have a lot of erythritol. And the majority of people in this study were not healthy. They are diabetics. They had a high blood pressure. They had a lot of, pro- they're overweight. They had a lot of problems. So obviously, they're going to have high levels of erythritol. And... The question is, this is the big question. Um, is it really the erythritol that's doing the problem? Or is it the health problems you have that is causing the heart problem? That's the question. Well, that's answered with the next next piece of the puzzle, which is fascinating. If you continue to research erythritol in, in animal studies, uh, you'll find that it acts as an antioxidant. It's an anti-inflammatory. It actually improves insulin sensitivity. It lowers glucose. It can help slow down the weight gain in, in certain studies. 
it it improves insulin resistance. Actually, it makes insulin resistance less resistant. So what's really probably happening when you have a higher level of erythritol is your body is probably using that erythritol to counter the bad effects from the sugar. So they kind of made this study and they had four different sections and they made these uh, these assumptions, which is totally based on you know, garbage information. And it was all observational. Well, most of it was observational. But stay tuned for a more in-depth um, review on that. But um, you don't have to worry about consuming erythritol at all. Um, like they say, or you'll see on all these news, like it's just right off the bat, you know, they grab this, this piece and they just want to alarm people. It's another, the, another one of those studies that um, they haven't really evaluated. They're just jumping to conclusions and it's, it's just garbage. Well, it certainly is. And they make it clickbait. So they obviously leave all this yeah, stuff out, just right. a couple of juicy comments. And you think once again, I'll be dead tomorrow. And here we all are alive and well. Okay. So uh, quiz question number two, again, much to the audience angst is not true false they had to do some real research and it asked the best way to deal with vitamin d side effects which are fatigue insomnia headache and constipation is uh and 80 percent of them say is to take k2 10 percent say to add more natural sunlight and 10 percent say add more magnesium or fiber well doc okay so the answer is magnesium. Now, these are all symptoms of magnesium deficiency. So if you are um, taking vitamin D, um, it doesn't really work if you're deficient in, in magnesium. Yes, you need K2 and you need zinc and you need B6, but magnesium is a really important one um, to take with uh, D3. And so um, if you're, again, if you're deficient in, in vitamin in magnesium and you take a lot of D3, you could end up with some side effects. So when I, sometimes when I hear this, like, oh yeah, vitamin D is bad because I had a, I got a headache or I got constipation. All that means is you, sh it's a great indication that you probably need more magnesium and all of a sudden the side effects go away. Same thing with insomnia. Um, now there is another uh, very rare side effect of hypercalcemia which but that's you'd have to take so much vitamin d like hundreds of thousands over months to um um to end up with um a problem with a kidney stone um but that's very rare and um but magnesium deficiency symptoms are, are more common so where do you get magnesium leafy greens okay so as long as you're following kind of what i'm recommending you're not going to have a magnesium deficiency because you have that salad each day. It'll give you plenty of magnesium. Magnesium associated with the chlorophyll. It's like the heart of the chlorophyll molecule. That's all the green stuff. So I um, just want to point that out, you know, just so you have that connection. Okay, very good. Asking for a friend, how much magnesium is in a large pepperoni pizza? Uh, probably not a lot. Mm. Unless mm. you, uh, it's made out of uh, your salad, which is probably not. All right, very good. Okay, let's see now. Uh, let's move on. Let's go back to our room. And I spoke of a nice young lady that was originally from Russia, but she's now my neighbor in Goldsboro, North Carolina. And uh, if she has unmuted herself, then uh, we're going to hear all from her. Here she is, Margo, currently from North Carolina. You're on the air with Dr. Bird. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm originally from Russia, and uh, in an early age, I found out through the medical expertise of Russian doctors, I was um, producing a very little of stomach acid, which is barbaric way how they do it, and they diagnosed me with the deficiency of all the vitamins. Fast forward, come to wonderful day of United States, I ended up to have a weird sensation in my legs and my knees and every muscle was jerking. Fast forward more, I ended up with two C. diffs, which I survived. And in the process, I was trying to prove my doctor, I am low in stomach acid and I cannot take um, suppressant for the acid, which is, was a battle for a year. And now I'm trying to figure out with that low stomach acid, which is in Russia, they told me I'm genetically pre-exposed or it's a genetic in me uh, because production was there, but it's very small amount. They actually suck it out of me. 
barbaric way, I'm sorry. <laughs> and now my OBGYN saying my iron is very low and saturation in my blood is very low and she prescribed me a supplement. But I know already supplement will only absorb if I have enough acid. Mm -hmm. So vicious cycles, you do one thing and they tell you to do another thing and then you try to figure out what is actually right for me. So I didn't have to make it my own way. I took a change my diet. I am now on fasting, same with my husband, which is he lost 62 pounds. And he's in a ketogenic diet. We eat salad. And I break my fast with caviar, an empty stomach, with the bromelain to kind of speed out of digestion. And sometimes I eat some nuts like walnuts and salmon so i'm trying to see what else can i put there to bring my b vitamin up bring my acid up and absorption of iron so did did you say that you can't consume betaine hydrochloride i actually do i actually oh, take it with my meal yeah okay yeah um i think you probably just need a lot more than the average person and that probably will help you um also, sea salt, or at least the chlorides in the sea salt will help build up the hydrochloric acid. But betaine hydrochloride is definitely something you should have before a meal. Now, um, if you don't have enough acid, you're more susceptible to anemia because you can't absorb some of the, the minerals, especially like iron and things like that. So if you wanted to um, solve the iron thing, I think the best thing would be to have a little bit of uh, liver in your diet maybe every other day. Uh, that would really be the best thing for your B vitamins. It's a super concentrated amount of B vitamins. You can also do the nutritional yeast and fortified. Uh, but I know the problem that you're running into because without that acid, um, boy, it's, um, you can end up with, um, you know, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. You can end up with, uh, um, an inability to absorb B12. But if you take the, um, the liver, you'll get B12 and iron and kill two birds with one stone. And um, see, what happens is when you eat liver or, or red meat, um, that acid is supposed to break it down so you can extract those nutrients. Well, your body has a hard time doing that. So you just might need to have a little bit more liver and then more acid so you can break it down. Um, but it sounds like you're on the right track. Um, you just want to focus on eating nutrient-dense foods, right? Like liver, fish, seafood. Yeah. Um, all that will is very high, especially self shellfish is very high in the nutrition that you need to help bypass this issue you have with the stomach. Um, if you do take, um, it might be helpful also to get a DNA test to see if there's any problem with what's called methylation, in which case you, sh you might be, be benefiting from taking like a methylcobolamine or a methylfolate um, to really kind of go deeper. So, so that would be my advice. Thank you so much because they actually laugh at me saying I'm Elsa because my fingers and my toes is ice cold even when it's 100 degrees outside. <laughs> wow, that could probably solve your problem because that's a, yeah, you'll get more blood flow. Um, I, I bet you anything if you did a, um, I did a DNA test, it would show up um, like you have a problem methylating and, and again, it's a simple solution. You take, you take a supplement with methylcobalamin methyl uh, folate with B6 and some of the other cofactors. And uh, I think that could really help you in a big way. That's great. Well, Margo, thank you so much for, um, do you have another question? Say, Go ahead. I was wanted to say, I do uh, take your yeast B vitamin and uh, uh, my husband is taking it with me. So we felt much big improvements right away because I actually take a bigger dose than it was recommended just because I know I'm deficient in it. And it was a dramatic change for sure. Well, that's interesting because um, that has in there the folate and it has the methyl, methyl uh, B12 too. So that's probably why you feel better. And um, it's good that you didn't take another version that's fortified because you probably would feel worse if you had the synthetic or the, uh, the, the folic acid. You don't want that. You want the folate. And I just did a video on that. But... Um, yeah, that, that's good that you stumbled on that. That's great. 
Well, that's, Thank you. That's terrific. Well, I tell you what, uh, Margo, I would rather lapse into coma than eat beef liver or any kind of liver, but you have a stronger constitution to me. I can tell that just by looking at you. So go ahead and eat some liver and uh, get back with us and let us know how well that worked out for you. Why don't we go on to the next question, Dr. Berg? And here it is. All right. So what is the primary indicator of a fatty liver? So what would be the the first obvious sign that you have a fatty liver? Without doing a blood test or anything like that, what, what's what what, is, what would be the the best indicator for that? Very good. By the way, back to that uh, question we answered before. Uh, a lot of people said K two. What can you remind us again of how K two interacts with uh, vitamin D and what what the relationship is there? Vitamin K vitamin K two is the partner of vitamin D three. Vitamin D three helps increase calcium absorption by 20 times in the small intestine and, and so you end up with higher amounts of calcium in the blood but then vitamin k2 directs that calcium where to go to push it in the bones and if you're deficient in k2 where a lot of people are deficient then the calcium can build up in the arteries and inside the walls of the arteries causing stiffness of the arteries and and high blood pressure so this is why when people take k2 with the D3, a lot of times their blood pressure is better. Um, that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's many other things that K2 does. And um, and one of the problems, um, people get confused between K1 and K2. If they're on warfarin, um, which is a blood thinner, um, to prevent clots, um, they don't realize that um, that blocks um, K1, but it also blocks the enzyme that K2 acts on. So this is why one of the side effects from warfarin is vascular calcification, uh, especially if you're taking more a lot of calcium. And so, I mean, here, here you're you're trying to thin the blood and prevent a heart attack by avoiding this the clotting, but then you end up with a calcium problem. So, um, you know, you really uh, if. If someone is on warfarin, I would definitely check with the doc to see if there's another type of medication that is that won't won't involve the K vitamins. Okay, so that's just a tip. Okay, very good. Let's go back to the green room. We're going to go through these, and we have uh, Ken, and he's also uh, from North Carolina. And Ken, if you've unmuted yourself, you are on with Dr. Berg. Oh, I see a mute. Oh, there okay. Go. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Excellent. The question I have is a year ago, I did a calcium scan and my number was 138. And recently I did a second calcium scan and my number was 173, which surprised me. Uh, for a couple of years, I've been taking 30,000 uh, international units of vitamin D daily. And uh, certainly for at least a year, I've been taking about uh, 300 milligrams of K2 daily. Uh, so uh, the question is, uh, I guess the bottom line is, what's causing my increase in calcium plaque? if you have any speculation. Uh, yeah. But uh, the other question is, 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 am I taking too much vitamin D3 um, or something else? I'm, I'm doing real good with uh, uh, keto. Uh, not completely as good as you, but I'm, uh, I'm, I'm getting close to a really good keto uh, uh, diet and regimen. Okay. Yeah. There's a couple things I would mention about that. Realize that, um, that score is not terrible. I mean, like if it was a thousand, I would be concerned, but you're just talking it's under 200. So, I mean, this is a somewhat a mild issue, but still, I understand we want it going down the opposite direction. So that being said, I'm glad you're taking the K2. Um, I would check I would check two things. I would check your blood to see what your blood levels are. Um, and then I would also get a DNA test and I would look at um, any genetic weakness that you have that could relate to this problem. 
Um, and then that might actually tell you a lot. Um, it's kind of like one of those uh, predictive information, especially what relates to heart. Um, and there's several different angles with that. The other reason for calcium uh, buildup is um, the parathyroid gland. And so that's another thing on my radar, the parathyroid gland. But, but here's the thing with the parathyroid. <laughs> when you're low in vitamin D3, your parathyroid then kind of can go into the bone and start taking calcium from that and building up in the arteries. Um, but I don't think that's your situation. Um, but there also could be, you know, a problem with the parathyroid that can be producing too much calcium. That's one factor. You also have um, biofilms, which is another thing that microbes that actually can hold calcium in the arteries. The other factor is um, tocotrienols, the vitamin E. I know that uh, is a really important thing for vascular um, inflammation that can then lead to this calcium calcium issue. Um, so we have I that. take uh, tocotrienols every morning. Okay, good. Good. And then the other thing that you may benefit from is maybe a chelator. A chelator. Um, you can, like cilantro, there's... There's various uh, EDTA, there's a chelator, and you could you can even start to do a little um, distilled water and um, and then take the minerals, take all the other minerals except calcium and to, to help balance this out. Um, but uh, I would first uh, get a test. I, I highly, it's highly unlikely that this problem is coming from the vitamin D. It, you know, I would, I would like to just do, I would just look at your diet really just to make sure that there could be something else contributing to this that you just you might need to just be a little bit more script strict. Um, so I mean, though, that's it's probably not the complete answer, but I think that's uh, as much as I can give you right now based on what I the data I have. But I would definitely get a DNA test because that can actually show you some hidden things that you're not even aware of. Great. Well, Ken, thanks so much for coming on with us. We're fighting the clock a little bit, so we've got to move on. And uh, we, but we always, as always, would love to hear back from you and find out uh, the great progress. Okay, uh, let's. We've got some answers for the third question, which asks, "What is the primary indicator of a fatty liver?" And uh, let's see. Terry claims that ninety percent of our respondents say it's belly fat. Five percent say puffy or yellow eyes, and five percent say insulin resistance. Who won? Well, the majority is correct. If Yay. you look down. Look down, down uh, at your shoes right now. If you see something, if you can't see your shoes, if you have any protrusion whatsoever in your belly, um, that is the best indication that we know the liver is fatty. Now, what's interesting about when you, when you have a fat cell and you eat poorly over time, the fat cell starts to expand, right? Well, there's going to be a point where the fat cell has a limitation. It cannot keep expanding. And what happens then is you start to get uh, a problem with the fat cell. It loses uh, um, blood supply. You start having um, dysfunctional fat cells. I mean, people are just so against fat, they don't realize it's actually a living cell. It's helping you. And then when that fat cell becomes damaged, that's when you start to um, have um, insulin resistance, okay? And that's when the fat cell can no longer be stored inside that cell. It goes, gets stored outside the cell. That's called ectopic. And I'm talking uh, about like amongst your muscle cells, around your organs, or around the liver, and it starts to build up in the liver. It's no longer in the fat cell. It's outside the fat cell. It's around your liver. And then now that insulin resistance starts picking up the pace and you, it, get, it gets worse and worse and worse. And uh, thank goodness you have some extra space as a backup space. You know, it's like the extra luggage around, around the cavity in your midsection. So you can hold, Steve, roughly between four to eight or more liters of extra ectopic fat in your belly. And your belly can keep expanding more and more and more to a certain point until it explodes. So um, <laughs> that... That basically is what's happening. It just tells us that ah, liver, liver fat. There is no way 
you can have belly fat and like a clean liver without fat. There's, it's impossible. So belly fat indicates liver fat. And even if someone doesn't have belly fat, they could still have liver fat too. Um, you just need to get an ultrasound, scan the liver, and see what's going on inside there. Okay, very good. Well, we're running against the clock a little bit. So uh, audience, you are always so fast. Here's question number four, Doc, and we hope they get us answers back so quickly. What is the best remedy for heal, uh, bone spurs? Okay. And also osteophytes, those little uh, spurs that you see in the joints and, and these calcium deposits. What would be the best remedy for that? Okay, very good. We've got a couple more in the green room. So, Gemma, I, because of our time, I'm going to ask you to give us one question and belt it out in 30 seconds. Go! Hi, Dr. Berg. I'm managing uh, Hydra Dentitis Superativa HS, and I've been taking metformin and spirolactone daily. I've been doing the clean keto for six months. Along with intermittent fasting, I feel absolutely great. I've lost weight, and I just got all my blood results, and they're phenomenal. My question is, how do you suggest your thoughts on dealing with this skin issue? And also, I'm supposed to start taking Umira next Friday. Mm. Well, I don't even know what that condition is. Can you just tell me briefly what that condition is? I've never even heard of it before. Yes. Uh, it's a condition. It's a skin condition, which has to do with the follicle area. Evidently, there's a protein that I make too much of, TNF-alpha. Mm, okay. Okay. Well, um, what I would do... Uh, if I were you and you're on the right track, um, you're actually on keto. And so you reduce this, this indic what she just mentioned, there's an inflammatory factor that's involved in the, it's an immune uh, inflammatory factor that, um, that needs to be reduced. And so you're on keto. So that's helping. Um, you see metformin also, believe it or not, um, it targets insulin resistance. And that's why it works for so many things. Of course, there's a big side effect of B12 deficiency, uh, lactic acidosis potentially. And so you need B1. And so just for the fact that you're on metformin, you need B, B1 and B12. So start taking those right off the bat. Um, but I would, if I were you, not just do keto, I would do, I would put emphasis on making sure there's no omega-6 uh, fats in your diet, like the soy oil, the corn oil, the canola, the cottonseed. I would really eliminate those, and I would beef up, no pun intended, uh, cod liver oil. That's what I would do if I were you. And I would also add one more thing, and that would be vitamin D3, uh, about 10,000 I use. Um, and then I would reevaluate uh, after about two or three months to see how you do. I think that should probably be the best thing for you. But um, I don't know why they're if you're doing better, why are they going to add another medication? I don't know. I have no, I don't have the details on that, but um, the goal would be to maybe go less medications over time because the keto and intermittent fasting will decrease the need for medication, especially if it's related to blood sugars or insulin resistance. Well, Gemma, we're about out of time here. Um, I'm sorry we can't answer, but we would love to hear back from you as you get uh, some more uh, progress in this issue. And thank you so much for getting back with us and uh, let's see so now uh we are going to hit social media because we should let's see debbie from facebook how can i rate how can i raise my blood pressure mine has dropped since taking blood pressure meds that make me dizzy what should i do seems like an obvious answer well, this, this is a classic classic if you take medications and it lowers and it's too low then you need to get with your doctor to take less of that medication because it's working too hard that would be the thing you need to do. I mean, you can add more salt and more water to get more volume, to get more pressure, but, you know, and that's not a bad idea, but I would first try to get with your doctor. I mean, um, especially if a lot of times when you do keto, the need for medication goes down and, and all of a sudden you end up with um, low blood pressure or 
even low blood sugar. And you're like, well, then take less medication because you don't want to take blood um, glucose lowering medication if you have low blood glucose. <laughs> Makes sense. Okay. Audience is on it. Thank you all so much. Uh, question four, what is the best remedy for bone spurs? And a lot of opinions out there. 55% say K2 or magnesium. 20% say lemon water. 20% say apple cider vinegar. And the remaining five are holding out for collagen. Uh, do we have any winners, Doc? Uh, all those answers are true. Yay. There's something a little stronger for bone spurs. Um, um, that would be phosphorus phosphorus. It, when you're deficient in phosphorus, um, you can, you have a tendency to get these de deposits. And, uh, when I was in practice, uh, we used a standard process product called fast food liquid it works good on bone spurs. So you might want to get that. I'm not affiliated with the company. I don't get any kickbacks. So you can just look it up, standard process, fast food liquid, um, take that works pretty good. So, um, just, just a little tip on a good remedy. If you have that problem, Okay, very good. That's great. By the way, Surrey, we see you there, and we're going to get right to you, but we want to launch out um, our last question, and here it is, Doc. All right, what is the most potent way to increase the number of mitochondria in your body? Okay, folks, grab onto that. And Surrey, thanks for being so patient with us. And Surrey is last but certainly not least, and she's from the great borough of Brooklyn. You're on with Dr. Berg. Hi, Dr. Berg. Thanks Hi. for taking my question. I'm a big fan. <laughs> um, I have a question in regards to styes. I often develop them on my eyelids. Um, I know what to do like when they're there, but I'm curious how what I could do to prevent it or like why they even come in the first place. Like, is there a so, nutrient I'm missing or some vitamins? Yeah, it's it's usually viral related and it just it's kind of like a little red light that means that you need either more zinc or you need more vitamin A, those two. And I'm thinking um, just from working with a lot of people with styes, I, I've, um, they're usually always deficient in vitamin A, but where do you get vitamin A? Well, egg yolks, butter, liver, things like that. But it could also be that um, the gallbladder is not quite, producing enough bile. So I always kind of look at that. So cod liver, for example, is a really good remedy for a vitamin A and D and omega-3. So that might be the best remedy for you. Um, and then take a little zinc and that'll, that'll help you. The other um, reason that you might be deficient in zinc is that st when stress goes up, people tend to deplete their zinc reserves or if they eat sugar and things like that. So you can end up with a, a little sty, a viral thing kind of coming out of remission. Like what What's going on? I came back with my eyelid there. So um, stress is another factor. Uh, I'm assuming, yeah, you're probably not coming 10 foot near sugar, so we can rule that out. But um, I would look at the stress point and the cod liver oil and, uh, and zinc, and um, that usually should handle it. Um, so that, that would be my advice. Thank you so much. That's great. Yeah. Thanks so much, Surrey. Thanks for hanging in there and being our last contestant, if you will. And uh, thank you. enjoy the spring up there in New York. Okay, let's see. We're going to wait for our answer for our final question. However, let's get back and pay homage to social media. Uh, let's see. Daniel from Facebook. Should men avoid flaxseed oil because of the estrogen content? For the most part, I would say yes, unless... Um there's some other indications. It, it does, you know, there are other benefits to flax oil, but I, flax seed, uh, but typically I, I don't recommend men having much of it because it can potentially have an estrogenic effect, not potently, but it can. And most people do have a problem with too much estrogen because of all the things that mimic estrogen in the environment. But there's a lot of people who have also a problem with deficiency, mainly women with estrogen. And that could be, um, especially right after pregnancy, especially menopausal. So, um, I think, um, I would not recommend that for men. Okay. Very good. And the audience is always on it. The final question, the data is in, what is the most potent way to increase the number of mitochondria in your body? And our a team of experts, 40% of them say fermented foods, 35% uh, 
of our respondents say fasting, 15% say exercise, and 10% say MCT oil. Okay, the most potent way is to exercise. And the exercise that creates the, the most numbers of mitochondria is the intensity of that exercise. So if you're doing some intense exercise, you're forcing the body to adapt and make a lot more mitochondria. Now, what is that going to do? That's going to actually give you more capacity for energy. You're going to walk around and go, wow, I just have a lot more energy. I feel better. And um, so if you have an energy problem, um, if you exercise, add exercise to it, um, you'll all of a sudden solve that problem usually, but there's other reasons why you might be tired. But yeah, exercise, and then, you know, of course, fasting will also do it, but exercise is the most potent way to increase more mitochondria. All right, that's great. And one of the reasons our audience may be so smart is because they were bright enough to download your great app so they can have these answers at their fingertips. And it's available on iOS and also on Android. So uh, I know many of you rely on that as sort of a cheat sheet, but it's not cheating, for goodness sakes. Learn what's good for you right there on the app and drberg.com. So why don't we have a marathon of um, social media to wrap things up. Uh, Chris from Facebook, Dr. Berg, I am taking niacin with, uh, flush my, to flush my cholesterol, but it's not extended release. Do I need to take extended release in order for it to be effective? Thanks. No, no, no. The one that uh, really works on cholesterol uh, doesn't have to be extended release, but you want to make sure you get the one that flushes. Not, don't get the, the non-flush, which is a niacetamide. You want to, you want to get niacin. Um, it doesn't have to be extended release, um, and it'll work nicely. It's a very, I mean, it's so researched on on lowering cholesterol and and other lipids, other you know problems with lipoproteins. It's like, which by the way, cholesterol is not lipoproteins, but um, the point is that it's a really good remedy for everything related to LDL and improving your HDL. I mean, amazing research on what it can do to the inside of the arteries. So it's a really good natural way. I'm surprised they even allowed that research because it competes with drugs. But um, of course, you're going to see some, some people saying, oh, yeah, it's going to create liver problems. But it's so rare. It's so rare. Um, and, and you'd have to have massive amounts of it. All right, very good. Renee from YouTube appears to be very disciplined, but she wants to know if she has a teaspoon of olive oil with minced garlic and a pinch of cayenne pepper mixed with water, will it break her fast? Not by too much. I would not by too much because fat's the only thing that's not going to um, activate insulin. And insulin is the key factor. Now, the fact that you're consuming a fat um, may cause a temporary shift of your body using that as um, a fuel source and not your own fat. So, but that's different than breaking a fast. It's more like inhibiting your ability to lose weight. Um, but it's a minor thing. And I think it's not a bad thing to do for many people, especially if you want to um, add some additional nutrients. Okay, very good. Well, um, you know, do you have any final words for the TGIF crowd around the world? We're running out of time. If there is any additional uh, topics or videos you want me to to do a video on, uh, please write them in the comments. I read a lot of your comments. I don't always respond to them, but I read them. And I really appreciate all the wonderful comments uh, last week, as well as uh, on this show right here. Thanks for being here this long. I will see you next week, same time, as well as every single day I release a video. So stay tuned for some more information that I think you'll like. 